Welcome to the Impatient Entrepreneur Podcast, a show where we hear from entrepreneurs and business owners who are chomping at the bit to make their mark on the world. I'm your host, Lauren Quedar Cockrell. Now let's hurry up and get to the good stuff. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We have something of a of almost like a meta episode today. We have John Foster, the founder and president of Middle School MBA here with us. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Lauren. It's so nice to be here. It's great to have you. Okay, so what is Middle School MBA? So Middle School MBA is the best way to think about it is an executive MBA for kids. So we teach business, economics, and entrepreneurship, all three, all integrated together. And and uh, we've so we've taken, just like you would do in an executive MBA program, we have a limited amount of time. So we've taken the most crucial pieces of all three subjects and um, knitted them together in a very intuitive way so that... Uh, there, it's easy to follow, but at the same time, it's it's complete. The whole story is there: uh, prices, supply and demand, marketing. The whole it's all there, all connected. But we do it super fast, and and we do it younger than anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. And what was the genesis of that? Why? How how did you get that started? Well, so it's kind of a long story. Uh, I graduated uh, way back in 1984 uh, with an MBA and an undergraduate degree in engineering. And I went into um, industry at that time, and I designed plants and built plants and ran plants and, and then uh, managed businesses and did M&A and corporate strategy. But along the way, I volunteered with uh, Junior Achievement to, to mm -hmm. teach in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I kept adding to, you know, you use their curriculum, but, but you mm -hmm. teach it. <laughs> and I just kept adding to it to the point where I had my own program. And, and I was teaching that um, in, in schools. And one day I was walking to class and I said to myself, why am I teaching 14 kids? I, I should teach 14,000. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's when I built everything out online and, and built the tools that I always wanted. And, uh, and so we've, we, we have this program now that's, uh, we've really captured the promise of blended education. You mm -hmm. know, we've, they've always said, um, okay, so online education has a lot of, a lot of problems. Uh, mm -hmm. in many cases you're, you're just, uh, the teacher turns on videos for the class mm -hmm. to watch. That's mm -hmm. not good. No. <laughs> or they're um, they're staring at a screen, reading a paragraph, answering a question, and clicking next. That's mm -hmm. not good either. Mm -mm. And 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 the problem there is when when you don't know who the student is, you're forced to come in at the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of kids are bored. Yeah. And so what we do is we don't go to the student, we go to the teacher. Our mm -hmm. software comes into the classroom, they project it on the wall, but we're in the teacher's head. We do a mind meld with the teacher mm -hmm. so that, and then that teacher, they get it right away. We've made this clear enough for, you know, this is graduate level material. We've made it clear enough for kids. Teachers get it right away. Mm -hmm. and And so then that teacher who knows every kid in the class, what the kids already know, how fast they can learn, et cetera, customizes the delivery for that particular classroom. So it's, it's, it's both 100% scalable and also customized for, for each class and even for each kid. Mm -hmm. And so what is your hope for the impact of your business. You, know, you talked about reaching thousands of kids, but long term, you know, when they're out in the workforce, what what do you hope the positive consequence of your program will be? Well, there's several levels to that. Um, on the immediate level, um, teachers and principals tell us all the time, our kids see the world better. They they understand how you know school is such an artificial environment and mm -hmm. and kids live in this environment you know for 18 years or so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we bring authentic 
business problems into the classroom. And, and then they experience these problems. And from there, we take them to the abstraction of those problems, which is economics. Mm -hmm. So the reason people hate economics is be because they think it's in inapplicable, it's sterile, it, it doesn't apply to me, but it does. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it does. And when you can couch it in terms of, look, this is, this is why you pay the price that you pay. This is why you care what prices are. This is why you care about profits, et cetera. All of a sudden, the world is, you know, we live in this, this ocean of commercial transactions. Mm -hmm. and, and to kids, it's just, just a mess, just a, just a disaster, like a, a blaster battle in Star Wars. You know, they're just <laughs> these projectiles heading every direction. But once they have this framework to look at it, all of a sudden it comes into focus. And, and so now they have a, a view of, of what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. And then we also, the other thing that economics does for you, it shows you the big picture. Here's the lay of the land. Here's, here's, here's what the, the landscape is like out there. So in, in essence, mm -hmm. we're giving them a, a map and a compass and saying, go out there and get your life. Mm -hmm. So the immediate effect is kids have a a bigger perspective, a clearer view of the world. They they take their studies more seriously. They um, oh they they incorporate business lingo into their vocabularies. <laughs> it's it's really amazing. It really sticks with them. And and so that's just and that's just a start. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, well, I said earlier that that we're realizing the promise of blended education. Mm -hmm. We've found a way, we're accelerating kids by five to 10 years. In fact, most kids, most kids will leave college or even grad school not understanding capital theory and price structure mm -hmm. and business cycles and all these things that we experience every day. Mm -hmm. Our, we have kids that are 11 and 12 years old that, <laughs> that have this. Mm -hmm. and And so... They're getting, um, we're delivering a big advance in how business and economics is taught. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do next is challenge other subjects to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, I have people come to me all the time and say, John, could you do this with math? <laughs> and, and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not the, the best math teacher in the world. I'm the best economics teacher. <laughs> but but math isn't my thing. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. once once this model is there, then we challenge. Then we go out and we say, okay, who is the best math teacher? Who's the best history teacher? Who's the best geography teacher? And we challenge them to to accelerate those subjects by five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So that's the the even bigger thing. And and, and then on a, I told you there were many levels. Um, <laughs> After that, so we do this on a for-profit basis. Okay, we're mm -hmm. one of the few for-profit companies in this space. Most people mm -hmm. are nonprofits, and they right. they give it away. But we're doing it on a for-profit basis. But because it's it's online, our costs are extremely small, mm -hmm. and particularly the incremental cost. You know, you pick up another thousand kids. The cost to do that isn't too much. Mm -hmm. If you're in India or Africa and you pick up a million kids, the cost is really, really low. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with uh, James Tooley at the University of Buckingham on ultra low cost private schools. Th these things mm -hmm. are spread all over Asia and Africa. And, mm -hmm. and parents send their kids to these schools for, for pennies or nickels a day. Mm -hmm. And what we're working to do is to deliver to them the best curriculum there is, Mills Columbia, mm -hmm. on a at a cost that they can afford, but what drives enough margin to make sense as a business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that again, and you go, okay, now they're they're getting business. Now let's give them history. You know, it's it's a viable business, right? And and so wow. Then then you're you're you've just I'm I can't even 
it's unimaginable the what the consequences of that would be if you take millions of kids and suddenly they go from almost no education to really the best stuff. I mean, how many Steve Jobs will come out of that? How many, right. who knows what? Yeah, all these future problem solvers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we need as many as we can get. <laughs> we do. It, and, you know, it makes sense for middle school MBA to be a for-profit. You know, you have to kind of walk the walk the walk and talk the talk, too. Like, you need to be a profitable business so you can prove that you know what you're talking about, too. <laughs> you, are, you are exactly right about that. Exactly right. And that's one of the reasons that, that we decided to be a for-profit. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have said, hey, we want to give you money. I'd say, I don't need your money. I want... Give me your Rolodex. You know, mm -hmm. I, I want to know the the superintendents and the secretaries of education. Who who do you know? I want to mm -hmm. talk to those people. I, you know, uh, I don't want your money. And you know, just like if if you're writing a book in like if if you're writing a novel, one of the a thriller in particular that I I know because I've I've done it. <laughs> one of the pieces of advice they give you is. If you want your characters to be stressed, stress yourself, and that will mm. come through in the writing. Mm. And so in the same way, by being a business, by feeling the pressures of, of mm. profit and loss and, and mm -hmm. headaches from customers and, you know, a hundred hats that you have to wear, you know, the whole mm. thing that goes with being yeah. a business that comes through in in the mm. in the lessons and sure. it and it gives an authenticity that that kids can yeah. really feel yeah eat, eat eat your own dog food <laughs> it's very important yes you, i'm so glad that you picked up on that right away i mean you're just you're so on the mark <laughs> uh and I, I love it and and what made you decide to focus on middle school versus high school or elementary school or college or you know well that's that was a bit of an accident um, mm -hmm. that wasn't by design exactly. I, I thought that we would teach high school when we started. Mm -hmm. But what happened was we kept finding we could do it younger and younger and younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the impact is, is, you know, it's just, it continues to grow with time. And so the sooner you get there, you know, the why not start now? Sure. We, do, we do have a high school version for, okay. for, for high schoolers. But, but it's basically the same curriculum because right. none of this is too young. We talk to everybody like an adult, right? There's no, mm -hmm. nothing is kiddified. We we show up like you showed up at a, at a meeting with a bunch of other executives and you just start talking the talk. And the teacher's job is to moderate that. If if kids are not, you know, if they're, if they're thinking and talking at a, at a seventh grade level, then the, the teacher takes the adult stuff down to seventh grade and and then mm -hmm. brings them back up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the beauty of having the teacher involved. We we don't bypass the teacher. We we rely on the teacher. Right. Plus middle school MBA has a nice bounce to it. <laughs> it really does. It really does. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, when we when we uh, applied for a trademark on middle school mm -hmm. MBA, the, the trademark office came back and said, well, no, you can't do this because because middle school MBA describes what it is as opposed mm. to who you are. And mm. so that's not, you can't trademark the thing. Mm. It has to be like its name or description. Unless, I, I consulted with, with uh, a friend of mine who's a lawyer, mm -hmm. unless the name is so incongruous that nobody would, would uh, real think of it as, as being what it is. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and so I went back to the patent agent and I said, well, you know, there's this incongruous uh, thing. And she goes, oh, yeah, this really is incongruent. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, the USPTO. <laughs> Our buddy. I spent many, many hours on their websites. <laughs> um, well, wonderful. Okay, so... Um, first official question, John, are you an impatient entrepreneur? You know, I am. I'm, in, I'm <laughs> impatient in general, mm -hmm. but, but I'm not frantic. I'm not mm -hmm. a frantic entrepreneur and that's mm -hmm. by design. Um, you know, I, I play in the angel investing space as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so many companies, you know, startup companies, when you go out and and raise capital, you have you have investor expectations, you have obligations to people, you have a runway with a clock that's tick, 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 tick. Mm-hmm. And if you miss the market by a little bit, you can have a great product and just crash because you didn't yeah. get there before your you know, before the end of your runway, or Mm -hmm. you spent, you had this go spend all your time trying to raise the next tranche of money to extend your runway. And, you know, you can get into this death spiral where all you're doing is raising money and it's harder Mm -hmm. and harder because your story looks less and less, you know, credible. Mm -hmm. And, and so on purpose, I wanted to avoid that. And so, so we built an ultra low cost company, which uh, didn't need outside capital. Mm-hmm. And and have really sort of taken a slower growth um, approach. So that, and you know, I was really fortuitous when uh, COVID hit because all mm-hmm. of a sudden every school, every customer went to zero overnight. Yeah. And for a year and a half, you know, so your revenues go from whatever they are to nothing. Mm-hmm. But because we have such low cost, we, we're able to just say, okay, we're going to, we'll just ride this out. And, yep. you know, not stress about it too much. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I'm oh, sorry to interrupt you. Did were you able? Uh, did your school clients uh, integrate you with their online schooling, or did y'all have to take a hiatus? No, we we weren't. We just weren't ready to go. Gotcha. Okay. That because our model is in the classroom. Uh-huh, it's a it's okay. a teacher with kids mm-hmm. in a classroom doing activities. They're negotiating. Yeah. They're building parts. Mm-hmm. They're pitching companies. Mm-hmm. They're evaluating. So it's it's really you. It's it's built for a bunch of kids who are together, mm-hmm. and and we have looked at doing live online classes, mm-hmm. which is what a lot of people were doing then. Right. But um, that's a different model, you know. Mm-hmm. And and now you need. Teachers, as it is now, with when the teachers in their classroom, they don't need anything else. We we our curriculum comes in. Their first thought is, "Oh, I can't teach this." <laughs> as soon as they look at it, they're like, "I got it. Here I go." And and so we don't need anything else. We just stream in the classroom overnight. It's going, and we're good. But okay. when you do live online, there's it's it's tougher to to do negotiating activities and mm. you can't you can't give kids pipe cleaners to build parts with and oh yeah <laughs> it all gets a lot tough it's doable but right but you, you just can't turn on a dime and do that right there's a lot more heavy lifting and making sure it's tailored and everyone's got a and the home teachers need a few more skills and blah blah mm-hmm. so there's a there's a real chance of stubbing your toe and and damaging your your product reputation, you know, mm-hmm. by getting crazy. So we, we didn't. And when did you found middle school MBA? So we kicked off um, commercially about five years ago. I left my okay. corporate job uh, to do this. I, okay. I kind of built it in parallel with, you know, with, mm-hmm. with working the corporate life mm-hmm. and then got myself fired so that I could, uh, <laughs> could do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strategic it was funny. Hiring. My 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 middle kid uh a, a few days after we're just saying, you know, it's just not right that you're walking around singing because you got fired. Something's wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of us are playing checkers, some of us are playing chess. <laughs> you're totally right. Totally right. Uh <laughs> um and so you started it and then COVID was not long after that then right. if it was about five years ago so um so i'm sure you're very happy when we went straight back into the classroom <laughs> thank god yeah mm-hmm. yeah for, for many for, reasons for any number of reasons yes yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh um and today um are are you in every state uh how how has your growth trajectory been no we're not in every state um we 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 reach probably um Oh, one to two thousand kids a year. Mm-hmm. We're in, uh, I think, of the U.S. states, probably half, mm-hmm. <clears throat> maybe, and then a lot of uh, a lot of places in Europe and mm-hmm. a few in Asia and Australia. 
So okay. we're, we're, we're kind of scattered around the world, but uh, yeah. we're, we've, you know, we started with the low hanging fruit, of mm-hmm. course, which is, um, as you do, <laughs> yes, which <laughs> as is, you should, <laughs> typically um, elite private schools, you know, they're the ones that are under competitive pressure with other schools and they have parents with high expectations. And uh, so, so those were, that was our first stop. And we racked up a bunch of those. And, and now we're moving toward uh, public school districts and, and even um, states, um, mm-hmm. the, the public schools in entire states. Uh, so mm-hmm. we're now we're, we're really out fishing for big, big fish today. Mm-hmm. And what does your team look like? It's tiny. <laughs> um, there's there's me. We have a few contractors for the website and accounting, but they're all part timers. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I have one one other employee, a marketing director, mm-hmm. um, who's also part time. And mm-hmm. and that's it. And you know, it's it's we we could grow faster if we like. If I went out and bar and raised a bunch of money and and put together a sales organization and all that, you know, we could go faster. Mm-hmm. But um, like I said, we've we've deliberately decided not to. Mm-hmm. And and so far it looks like that might work out. I mean, these um these recent talks I'm having with, you know, like the state board of education and mm-hmm. state X are it's a monster customer. And and even just your your public school district, your local county school district is an enormous customer. They they have tens of millions of dollars, you know, that they spend on curriculum mm-hmm. and stuff. And mm-hmm. and and one of the beauties of middle school MBA is you don't need a subject matter expert. Whoever your teacher is in the classroom, we're there tomorrow, and and they're teaching it and they're loving it, and everybody feels like they're punching above their weight. So. <laughs> um, I'm ex- I'm expecting to actually have a hockey stick uh, on the sales as, as opposed to a nice <laughs> a hockey stick uh, fantasy, you know. Right, right. Um, and you know, some some people, I guess they say, more companies go out of business through um, indigestion than starvation. Like, is that a concern for you? I mean, can you handle really any any exponential growth uh, yes. as designed? That's the beauty. We could. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could be in uh, every every school in Dallas next week, every school in Texas uh, wow. in three weeks. Nice. So, yeah, we, the, the, <laughs> it, it scales beautifully. A little different than building a plant. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's so different, you know. The, the but the the place where it's similar is that the upfront investment has been enormous in terms mm, of sure. time and work and. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and um, building the the structure of the business in a way that it can scale, you know, and mm-hmm. and, and being able to to do it through somebody without a business background, um, mm-hmm. every step of the way is is tedious and and mm-hmm. tough, and it and multiple iterations. So I think of it a lot like a plant. It's this sure. huge investment up front over a long period of time. And and then you push the button and stuff just starts coming out the end like crazy, you know. Right. I mean, it's you know to create a, a detailed curriculum that can be delivered by anyone. Uh, that's out. That sounds tedious. <laughs> just it is. To be able to <laughs> it's it, you know it's 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 difficult. And I had um, when I first started a couple of um, two different um, occasions. These uh, well-known economists, if you were in the space, you'd know their names. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They came to me and said, man, I love what you're doing. This sounds so cool. Can can I help write curriculum? And I go, yeah, okay. Um, Let's give it a shot. But here's what you got to understand. It's not the way we learned it. It's Mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. this isn't, this isn't a course that kids have to take, right? Mm -hmm. They they have to pass your course to graduate. And so... Mm -hmm. We can't just slam them with a, with a, with whatever we want, and it, you know, mm-hmm. say it's your problem. It has to be, <laughs> it has to be so, it has to go down so easy mm-hmm. that they want it, 
and that the value is huge and that they're actually willing to pay us for it. You know, this is this is totally uh, optional for them. And so you have to think in terms of of how how much they're going to love it. And neither one could do it. They yeah. they it was like they just opened the same textbook and said, "Okay, now we're going to say this and now we're going to say that." Uh-uh. That's just that's not it, guys. No. And so in both <laughs> cases we had to part company um on a, on a, you know, friendly basis, but they just couldn't do it. And and so when I talked earlier about using this model for other subjects, that's what somebody has to do. Your history teacher has to go, oh, I, I kind of see how you, how you took this material and got in kids' heads with it and mm-hmm. started them out with something very concrete and easy and yet interesting, and then, mm-hmm. and then walked them smoothly up this path to, to an abstraction that's, that's really profound. You know? mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the pattern that, that needs to, they need to replicate. And that's what's going to just change things like, like yeah. crazy. <laughs> uh, I'm having some not positive flashbacks to <laughs> econ in college. <laughs> oh, listen, listen. I, I, sometimes I'll talk to a group of people and I'll say, okay, for which of you people, which, who had economics as your favorite class? Right? Nobody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the kids in middle school and BA say it is their favorite class. Mm. That overwhelm. We just had a, uh, and not only kids, we just had one of our schools did a, a parent survey. Like every two or three years, this this school does, uh, they hire an outside company to survey the parents to find out what they're doing well, what they're doing poorly, whatever. And And so this survey came back and of all the electives, middle school MBA was hands down favorite. P E R awesome. language music, go down the list, you know. When, and it wasn't even close. We were, we were mm-hmm. and, and so I'm like, uh, look out, lunch. We're coming after you next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just think about you know so many so many stories that I hear on this podcast and with our clients and just the the challenges of being an entrepreneur and all the things we learned the hard way. And, you know, gosh, to have learned the easy way would have been nice. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you impatient about anything in particular right now? You know, I guess you're having these big conversations. Do you have something, anything new coming out? Um, you know, is, is there anything on the horizon for you? Well, as far as new, right now I'm I'm working on a, a Bitcoin lesson. Oh, um, cool. Nice. I I kind of surveyed a few teachers and said, mm-hmm. what do you think? Would you want a Bitcoin lesson? They said, would we? Uh, <laughs> you know, kids are always asking us, what is this yeah. deal with, with mm-hmm. cryptocurrencies? And we have no idea what to say. Mm-hmm. And and so as usual, we're 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 building a lesson that that starts crazy simple. And then goes all the way to something profound, you know, and mm-hmm. I've always been a Bitcoin skeptic for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. until last summer, I heard, uh, uh, who's the guy, uh, the economist that, that did, uh, Art Laffer. I, uh-huh. mm-hmm. I heard Art Laffer talking about Bitcoin and I thought, maybe I need to look at this. <laughs> and so I did a deep dive last summer and mm-hmm. And guess what? It's for real. This this is the real deal, mm. and the the potential is is just uh, crazy for what Bitcoin might do. Mm-hmm. And and so I'm now one of those annoying Bitcoin people that that want to tell you about <laughs> it. And but it, it's something everybody should understand. And so sure. so we're building this lesson that again anybody can use it, anybody can learn it, mm-hmm. and that's coming out. Uh, I hope this fall. Okay. And uh, and then I'm also working just before we we talked. I'm I'm uh, preparing for a a pitch uh, contest um, at, a, at a at a conference. And I was as I was putting together some slides, I I, I did one on our uh, unit cost and margins, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, this is beautiful. This is because <laughs> <laughs> it's like here's here's the here's the prize. <laughs> here's some 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 tiny variable cause. Here's a nice fat contribution margin. And then here's some kind of hefty fixed cost. 
-hmm. and then a a uh, a reasonable EBITDA, mm -hmm. but but these fixed costs at scale are going to approach zero, right? And right. now all of that stuff is going to fall. That big fat contribution is going to fall to the bottom line, mm -hmm. and it's just it's it's going to be a thing of beauty, it really. Is. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Middle School MBA. <laughs> Um, so you have an education business, but how do you fuel yourself? How do you educate yourself and stay on top of things? Do you listen to books? Do you listen to podcasts? Sounds like you heard Mr. Laffer. Like what, um, how do you keep yourself on top of your game? It's, it's tough. Uh, books, podcasts, a lot of podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. and then conferences, uh, like for, mm -hmm. for Bitcoin, you know, I, I heard Laffer, I, then I got into the books and, um, there's so much good info. Fidelity Investments did a beautiful white paper. They were one of the first really mm -hmm. big firms to go, you know what? You better pay attention to Bitcoin. Right. And so their white paper is extremely good. So white mm -hmm. papers and then talking to people at conferences is amazing. You, mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like, you know, for, for a vacation, a lot of times the best part of it is something you never expected to happen. Sure. Mm-hmm. Same at a conference, you know, you're like, oh, another conference, Who, who's going to be there, what the heck? And then you're sitting next to this amazing person that, that gives you this insight that blows you away. Right. So right. Uh, It's not the keynote, it's the sidebar. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, so... Let's just look, take a look back. It, it could be this, this, uh, this business or it can be a prior, uh, uh, role. Um, but in your business life, what's something that's happened to you where it, the rug got totally pulled out from underneath you? You're like, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. But then ultimately you realize that it was actually the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, you know, big old um, smile on your face. <laughs> because I, I got exactly that with uh, yeah. <laughs> in the early days with with middle school MBA. It's like ten years ago when I was first starting to try to build a, an online business. You know, ten years on the web is like a hundred years. Yeah. So <laughs> ten years ago, you didn't have the kind of tools that you have today. You didn't have, I think. Um, I mean, all the all the stuff for building websites, et cetera, et cetera, places that would would host your lessons, like Teachable, and mm -hmm. these are, they just didn't exist, right? Kajabi, all those. <laughs> yes, you you were just what we call stick building in industry. You know, take one piece and glue it to another piece, and mm. writing code and all this kind of stuff. I had no idea to, how to do any of that stuff, mm -hmm. and and so I interviewed uh, a few firms that. You know, that built websites and um, did my due diligence and then hired this guy. He had he had a good looking background and he had done work for Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you know, some big customers. And and, you know, he. Uh, uh, I kind of asked, you know, what are the mechanics of this? How 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 do we get from A to B here? I don't understand any of this he says no don't worry don't worry you know we we got it we do this all the time if <laughs> he's okay so i paid him half the money mm -hmm. up front and the dude just ripped me off he mm -hmm. just did nothing and you know several weeks in i'm like so how's it going you know show me some some work that you've done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he kept putting me off and playing games and blah blah and and finally i realized you know he hadn't done a thing mm -hmm. and and uh, so uh, I ended up uh, suing him, trying to get the money back. He was he was so crafty that my lawyer couldn't find him to issue mm -hmm. a wow. summons. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, I just got after it was embarrassing because you know I'm a business guy. I, I'm not yeah. supposed to get taken, but mm -hmm. sure enough, man, he got. And in fact, um, uh, a year or so later, I walked into a shop. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye, sitting there, and I, I acted like I didn't see him. And I walked to the back of the coffee shop. I called my lawyer and said, look, <laughs> this guy is here at the coffee shop. Do you want me to go tackle him? <laughs> you can serve him. <laughs> oh, man, I went back out there. He had left. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> it's probably in the coffee shop, but. 
Yeah. That's my story. Oh, so that's how I got screwed. And and how, mm-hmm. I mean, when that happened, I was like, just at, at zero now. Oh my God, I don't know what to do. I've just lost a whole bunch of money. Mm-hmm. You know, my own personal investment in the thing. And I don't know what to do. And, and then um, somebody sent me a link to some, like teachable, some, some things like mm-hmm. that. And so I started digging into that and, and I found um, some software that, that it's, it's like uh, PowerPoint on steroids, mm-hmm. create mm-hmm. stuff in it, but then mm-hmm. it'll render into HTML and it looks like you're a flash programmer, but you're really not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and that's become the foundation for for how mm-hmm. and that allowed us by being able to do that, it allowed us to control the lessons completely. And now I just park them out on my website. I got a very simple website, very low maintenance, with a with a, a paywall in front of the lessons. Mm-hmm. And all I got to do is is you know point people to the have a dashboard that points you at the lessons. So it, it ended up being a beautiful, simple, clean efficient system that uh and and if this guy had actually come through i'd have probably had something that wasn't nearly as good yeah it super custom me. you need it if you would have been married to him forever to make yes. kind of little changes yeah yes mm-hmm. it would have been a mm-hmm. mess yeah i i have unfortunately dealt with some providers over time you know support you know, in working with uh, some of our pr and marketing clients were like well here's our website and we are with this other company that's done this and we can't make any changes on our own and i just every time want to just break my desk over my <laughs> knee <laughs> like you know i just don't think that's right i think you like you can you build them this and you hand them the keys like they should feel totally equipped to do anything that they need and they should not need you after that point unless it's something major they just don't want to if they don't want to that's their decision but it needs to be their decision about what's next and i don't i think if you like hand build this custom uh um sports car that they can't drive i just i think you've done them a huge disservice absolutely absolutely you should you should have off-the-shelf parts Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry that happened, uh, but I'm glad you've ended up finding the right solution. <laughs> um, so when you were a young boy, John, um, oh was God. there a, <laughs> was there, did you, do you have a personality trait where when you were younger, people were like, oh, John, uh, uh, you're just so fill in the blank. And they really made you feel like that personality trait was a weakness. But flash forward to today, you realize it's actually your superpower. You know, I would, I would say people were, were were really pretty kind to me despite how um how annoying i was <laughs> but um the thing that i had to really overcome was my my personality type is uh, intj mm-hmm. and intjs are are very shy um you know thomas jefferson was an intj most people don't know he wouldn't talk to a group of people he wouldn't mm-hmm. speak in in a group of almost any size. That's how shy he was, mm-hmm. and and uh, so shyness was something that was really tough for me to. I knew I had it, you know. I knew it was a was a problem, but it took me a long time to to deal with it. And um, mm-hmm. I actually have have tried to interest some people in um, psychology type type people in. Mm-hmm in building programs for shy people mm-hmm. because um it's all in their own head you know mm-hmm. all of it in mm-hmm. fact even in middle school mba we have uh, uh one of our lessons is about uh meeting and greeting other people mm-hmm. and and one of the mm-hmm. points because and so we formally teach them that they think about their future what i want to do and they they make a business card and and then they introduce themselves with their mm-hmm. business cards, you know, formally how how you formally introduce yourself, and mm-hmm. and then take pictures with the card so they make like a, their own CRM. Mm-hmm. And 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 one of the points we make in there is it's really important to have this network of people that that you know, mm-hmm. and those people want to know you. So you know go say hi they they want you to you're the you're the boss when you say hi when you're the first one to say hi mm-hmm. and and then we also tell them like in the in our negotiating um lessons we we say look uh 
Next time you go to McDonald's and they say that'll be seven ninety five, say, what well, would you take six fifty? <laughs> <laughs> and you know they're going to say no because a, you've already they don't have right. power to change. That. And two, they don't have the power to say <laughs> yes, right? But it allows you to have this experience of making an offer and getting rejected and finding out you didn't die, mm-hmm. and and then being comfortable enough with it that you can even make an offer that you know is not going to be accepted, but make it in such a way that they know too and you know, and you've created this game between you. And mm-hmm. and now you you kind of have this friend that works at McDonald's, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's so so important and and so difficult for particularly you know it was hard for me as a kid but you know nowadays everybody's walking around staring at a screen mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and they're even less socially adept than we were when we were kids, yeah. yeah. So that was mm-hmm. that was a, a a trait that I had as a kid that uh, that I. I really, I had to deal with and, and try to overcome. I'm, not, I, I'm really interested in helping one of my one of my my oldest daughter. She's also an INTJ. Mm, okay, <laughs> and um, she's also a big Harry Potter fan. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, when they when they describe INTJs in in books about the, mm-hmm. you know, they they say uh, these children go to school in a world of aliens. <laughs> and it is so right. That's exactly right. And so my my daughter and I, we were talking about having a thing like Harry Potter, where we would go survey all of these kids, find all of the INTJs, and send them a letter, not with an owl, but just mm-hmm. you know, that that says, "Hey, there are many more of us out there, and we will find <laughs> you." <Yeah. it." laughs> yeah. uh, well, I loved how you've baked it into the curriculum because I do think. In a lot of environments, the the squeaky wheel gets the grease, the loud, boisterous person is yeah. equated with success or whatever. But, you know, the the ones who need some encouragement or or confidence building to they have they have gifts also. And so being able to see that and pull it out of them or or give them the scaffolding to figure out their own way. Cause I imagine like I did, you just you figured out a way to get over it <laughs> or right. just, you know, just power through. Um, but if you could have been, had a safe place to practice that as a young boy, um, uh, that I probably would have fast forwarded things a little bit from here and there. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, I had a, a one of my, um, one of my mentors and a, and a prior boss, um, I used to be terrified of public speaking. It's not my favorite thing today, but I'm less terrified of it now but at one point we were um we were ha- hosting an, or we put on an event for 800 people in this huge ballroom and i went up to her and i said okay it's it's time to get on the stage to do the next segment of the program and she said no i'm not you are and uh so you know trial by fire i was just thrown up on stage wow. and I, there's, <laughs> there's a picture of me holding like gripping white knuckling <laughs> the microphone <laughs> i totally blacked out during it but <laughs> okay i got a brain trick for you okay it's a brain trick. When when you're encountering something like that, that that's mm-hmm. scary. You know, you've got this fight or flight mechanism yes. that that yes or freeze <laughs> is often my problem. Or freeze, <laughs> and and that's that's cortisol mm-hmm. doing its thing. And then there's another hormone. I forget the name of it, but but it's the sort of the opposite hormone, the the mm-hmm. the calming one, mm-hmm. and. What you can do is say to yourself as you're approaching this thing, whatever it is, say, this is going to be fun. Say that mm-hmm. to your brain. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't know the difference, you know? And <laughs> But then it generates the, it, it chills the cortisol and it, mm-hmm. and it kicks up the other hormone. So it's just mm-hmm. a different way to, for your brain to approach this, this thing that's coming up. And it, it's, it. it's remarkably effective. This I'll is going to be fun. <laughs> also, tried beta blockers. That helps too. But yeah. <laughs> but, but, this shot sounds easier. Scotch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This sounds uh, maybe easier. Um, okay. As we get toward the end here, um, what is one piece of advice you can give our listeners that they can do today, if possible, to make their lives better and stronger? That's a, that's a, that's a tall question. Um <laughs> You know, your your best investments are almost always in yourself. 
Mm-hmm. And and so look at yourself honestly. Look where you might have weaknesses or even strengths that could be a lot stronger. But wherever it is, find find what could be better about you and and go after that. Mm-hmm. And and in a in a bigger, broader way, um the whole deal, and, and I, I'm seeing this a, a lot more. It's, it seems to be getting into the ether, and I'm so happy it is. But telling the truth is, is so incredibly powerful. And mm-hmm. I, I told my kids this all their lives. I said, look, if you're committed to telling the truth, it changes the course of your life. Mm-hmm. It means, because you, you've got an infinite number of paths available to you. But if you say... I'm committed to the truth. I'm going to tell the truth now. I'm going to tell the truth about what I did. I'm going to tell the truth. All of a sudden, a lot of these paths go away because they involve deception or lying, and it mm-hmm. changes your path through life. Mm-hmm. It also makes you stronger, and 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 it 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 makes people. You know, when I started my career, I felt like I was uh, at a disadvantage because. I would see people around me fudging the truth about things. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, I followed up with them. I'm waiting for them to call me back, or you know that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And but you know, as as time went by, I found that it was a, a huge advantage because when when people figured out that I I wasn't going to BS them, then even even people who are rotten and crooked, they want to be told the truth. Right, mm-hmm. so they start seeking you out as mm-hmm. as the trusted source, and the and so it, it it's it's even a there's not a a disconnect between what's ethical and and what's effective in mm-hmm. in the long term. In, in the short mm-hmm. term, it often feels like it is, but mm-hmm. but in the long haul, it's just not. It's a it's a huge competitive advantage to yes. always be ethical. Mm. As is. So poignant. And I, you know, I see this not necessarily with our clients, but in the communications realm in general, where people really don't want to tell the truth, especially in a crisis or something, you know, when, it, yes. when it's bad and they're nervous to, if I tell the truth and they're going to find out that I made a mistake or whatever, it's like, well, if you don't, they're still going to find out. <laughs> exactly. You want to be the one to tell them. But it's, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so true. it's, Definitely something like, you know, just to even or if you don't know the answer to say you don't know the answer, Um, Uh you know, people feel like they have to I feel like there's so much pressure to be right all the time or to know everything. And that's just not possible. Right. Um, And that's when I coach uh, some of my younger team members. I to to give them the freedom to not know something and just say, like, you know, I'll get back to you on that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It just saves you so much heartache in the end. (laughs) And it damages your credibility all along Mm -hmm. because. People might not call you out on it, but mm-hmm. but much of the time they know they know that you fudge that you know, that, yep. but they let you get away with it. But but they can't unknow the fact right. that that you that you deceived them. Mm. Well, I'm so glad your program is out there. I hope it reaches as many children as possible so that our next generation of leaders is that much more equipped to pro- solve problems and bring great solutions to our world. Um, so thank you for being here, John. Um, will you tell everybody where to find you? Oh, yes. Uh, middleschoolmba.com. Everything's right, right. there. Middleschoolmba.com. And it's been so sure nice, it's... Lauren. It's so terrific yeah. to meet you. I hope we can do it again sometime. I'd love to. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Impatient Entrepreneur. Love the podcast? Be sure to share it with a friend or colleague and give us a five-star review. You can also chat with us on Instagram or Facebook at The Impatient Entrepreneur Pod. Want to star on a future episode? Head over to theimpatiententrepreneurpod.com to inquire. Thank you to the team at Queedar Co. for believing in me and bringing this podcast to life. And thank you to Carson Childers for mixing and editing this episode. I can't wait to see you next time.